the Adaptive Security Appliance version 8.3 and higher, Network Address Translation. Let's jump in. A friend emailed me a few months ago and said, hey Keith, a really good idea for a nugget would be NAT version 8.3 and higher on the ASA. And I said, you know what, that's a really good idea and here we go. In this micro nugget, we're gonna take a look at auto NAT, what it does, how it works with objects inside the ASA. We'll also take a look at manual NAT the three sections in the net table and also creating and verifying that. As a heads up, you and I know that the internet doesn't support RFC 1918 address spaces, private address spaces like the 10 or the 192.168 or the 172.16 in that range in there. However, what I'm going to do for this simulation is we're going to go ahead and treat this network right here as if it's an outside globally routable network. I am doing that right here on this router to make the internet play nicely with us. Having said that, let's take a look at what an object is on the ASA. An object is like an alias. It's like a shortcut. Imagine a shortcut sitting on your desktop. You click on the shortcut, it leads to something else. Well, an object inside the ASA, we can have an object that's referring to the 1000 network. We could have an object, for example, that refers to a pool of addresses. So maybe we have a pool of addresses, 192.168.1.1. 51 all the way through 100. So if we have these objects, we can refer to them basically by modifying the object. We can also, almost as an afterthought, say, oh, you know what, by the way, as I manipulate the object for the 1000 network, let me go ahead and tie NAT to that. So it says an afterthought almost, and they call it auto NAT because you work with the network object. And then, by the way, you can also configure NAT for it. So auto NAT, sometimes called object NAT, that's what it does. Let's use auto NAT to manipulate the object for the 1000 network. And let's go ahead and do network address translation as it goes out to the internet and translate it to this pool of addresses. Both of those objects, one for the 10 network and one for this pool, have already been created. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. In fact, I'd like to show you the NAT rules here on the ASA. There's no NAT rules by default. My hands will never leave my arms. Check this out. We're gonna go down to objects and go to network objects. And these are several of the network objects that I created. Let's go take a look at the one for the 10 network. So this is the an alias representing the 10 network. If we double click it to edit it, there's the details for it and check this out. Here's an option to configure NAT for that network object. This is auto NAT. So we'll say, I wanna do translation, sure. I wanna do dynamic translation to a pool of addresses. So we grab the object representing the pool, which is right there. We'll double click it, puts it down here. I'll click okay and poof, we've got auto NAT. Let's take a look at the commands. It says, okay, great. For this network object called inside 10, we're gonna use NAT dynamically, and we're gonna use the outside pool, that range of addresses for it. I didn't have to specify source interface or destination interface. Those are options, but not required, and I'm done. I've now got auto NAT set up. So how do we verify something like that that actually works? We can go up to NAT rules, and we can notice that, hey, there's a NAT rule saying traffic from any interface to any other interface. If it's sourced from the 10 network, go ahead and add it to the outside pool. To verify that, we can go ahead and bring up the command line interface of the ASA. Let's just do a clear x -Lite to make sure we're on clear ground. We'll do a show x -Lite to make sure we have no translations in use. Let's do a show NAT. Now, it shows us in NAT that we're in section two. Now, what is section two? I wanted the best seats. I wanted section one. Well, here's how it works. Anytime we create auto NAT or object NAT, as it's sometimes referred to, it's gonna put it in section two of this table. If we want to create manual NAT rules, we can put those in section one above the auto NAT, or we can push them to the end after the auto NAT. We'll do that coming up. So let's test it and see if this works. Let's go ahead and open up a browser, and we'll go up to the internet. Let's see if I have a link for Google. I don't, so I'll go to Google. There we go. So we'll go to google.com. That seems to work just fine and dandy. Let's go back to the command line interface. Let's do a show x -Lite for the translations. It says, sure enough, there's a Translation for a host at 100051. His translate address is 58. The flag is I, which it represents it was dynamic from a dynamic network address translation rule. And it's been up for about five seconds. Fantastic. So that is object NAT. You work with the network object. In fact, even if you go to the NAT rules and you say, I want to add a new rule, if you say add network object NAT rule, it just is the same menu that brings up the interface and says, oh, do you want to create a network object? And by the way, do you want to create a NAT rule for this network object? So let's go ahead and create a scenario where we want to override the default behavior. 
So an example of when we'd want to do a manual rule and have it run before the object now would be if we had one of this PC at top 51 when it was going to a specific destination then and only then use a specific different IP address for the translation. So now the pool is 51 through 100 and that's for the auto nav that happens as this guy goes out to anywhere. But if we have, for example, a host at 253, which we do, I've got a little router named R2 there. He's just waiting for us. And if we wanted to say, you know what, if this host is going to this IP address, then we want you to go ahead and NAT to 101 instead of this pool. We can use that as a manual NAT rule at the top of the stack in section one of our three sections with auto NAT being in the middle. And that way our manual NAT would happen first. Sort of like policy NAT in the good old days. So to do that, let's go do a couple things real quick. Let's bring up our device. And let's just verify what our IP address is. It's 10.0.0.51. That's this PC. I also want to just verify that we can telnet to that device and make sure we can connect. We'll type in who. That's the shortcut for show users. And it shows us as connecting as dot .172. And that's perfect. That's from that pool of dot .51 through dot .100. But if we change the rules, let me exit out of this. And let's go back to our interface. And because we're going to create a manual rule, we have to do it from NAT rules. We'll click on add and add a NAT rule, a manual rule, before the network object NAT rules. So I'll click here and it'll say, great, source interface, I don't care. Source IP address, 10.0.0.51. So I select an object for that. Destination address, if I'm going to the IP address of 253, I either create or click on the object for that. And then I say I want to do static translation, but I want to translate to a new address of 192.168.1.101. That's different than it was previously. So we'll go ahead and say, yep, double click on that, click OK, apply it, and check this out. This is saying that if traffic is coming from Keith, his local IP address, go ahead and translate to the global address if the destination is the IP address of R2. And we're not doing destination here, Nat. I'm not changing the destination of the IP packet, just the source based on a set of conditions. This is called manual Nat. So we'll click on send and take a look at where it put it. Now, if we take a look at the command line interface, and this gets fun, if we do a show NAT, we now have two sections. The first section is our manual NAT, like our policy NAT that we just created. And if we don't have a match there, the next set of rules would be the auto NAT. The third section is, again, manual NAT policies that we can push to the bottom. To demonstrate this is working, let's go back to our command line interface, and let's tell NAT again to that same device. We'll do a show users and take a look at our source IP address now. We're now appearing to come as 1.101 because of our policy NAT. One last trick, if we wanted to go ahead and put a manual policy at the end, if there wasn't a match in the first set of policies or in the auto NAT, we could have a third one. And I'm going to simply take this policy here and I'm going to push it down with the arrow and it pushed it to the bottom. We click apply. It simply adds the keyword after auto. So it's manual policies at the bottom in section three. So to see that, if we go back here and we do a show NAT, Take a look at this. My auto NAT policy is first because I don't have any mon manual policies before auto NAT. And then I have my manual NAT in the third section. So the three sections of NAT include, if we go back to our discussion here, the three sections are the manual NAT and the first position. Then we have auto NAT. And then the last third section is the manual NAT that's been pushed on purpose after the auto NAT rules. I have had a blast introducing you to the topic of the auto NAT and the manual NAT rules. For the full scoop, come and visit us in the CCNP Security Firewall class, where we'll talk about destination NAT and a whole host of other options. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.